Welcome back to part two of our analytical playthrough of Ultima 4, Quest of the Avatar. I'm Michael Corlim, and if you missed part one, what are you even doing here? Go, get out of here, go watch that one first. To complete the game, we need to master all eight virtues, gather a party of eight heroes, hit level eight, enter the Abyss, and gaze upon the Codex of Ultimate Wisdom. So far, we've used ethical loopholes to quickly master compassion, honor, and sacrifice. And when we left off, we'd collected the rune and learned the mantra for justice, so we're off to the Justice Shrine. And here it is. We meditate and we get another vision. We now have two ends and two eyes. With the addition of justice, we are halfway to full-on Avatar status. But in another sense, we've still got a long way to go. Let's go back to the castle and check in with Hawkwind to see where we're at. There is a lot of overlap between the virtues, and this is one of the points where the system breaks down. Honor, honesty, justice, it really does come off as feeling a little superfluous, almost sloppy. The point of interest here is the way that justice and valor interact. Fleeing non-evil creatures raises justice but lowers valor, so we end up dancing between the contradictions of the virtues. They shouldn't be seen, perhaps, as a single unified font of good, but rather individual forces pulling the Avatar in different directions. The game doesn't spell out this to you, for you directly, but rather lets the player come to their own conclusions from the advice on virtues given out at the shrines, and by virtuous NPCs like Hawkwind. Oh, don't want to lose our horse again. We'll just park you outside where it's safe. Okay, we're good to go for honesty. Not quite yet the others. We'll visit Lord British and heal up, then head east to the guild shop in Vesper for some magic keys. If you're new to Ultima, or just more familiar with the console RPGs of the late 80s to mid 90s, you might think a lot of this looks pretty familiar. Well, it is. The Ultima games were hugely influential on Yuji Horii's development of the Dragon Quest franchise arguably the most successful 8- and 16-bit console RPG series in Japan, and thus a huge influence on Final Fantasy and everything that came after. Ultimum wasn't the only influence, of course. Wizardry was also a big part of it, and probably the bigger overseas hit. But much of what we saw in Ultima's 1 through 3 made it into 1987's Dragon Quest, and not just the tile-based overworld. Of course, the combat system was definitely more wizardry than Ultima, and perhaps a bigger influence on the genre's development in Japan was the limit of consoles like the Famicom. You can do a lot less with a D-pad and two buttons than an entire keyboard. Before we go on to Ultima 5, I think I will take a quick diversion to some of the Japanese console RPGs of the era, just to show you what influence they took from Ultima and games like it. I completely missed the fact that we've been poisoned for a while, so let's make a quick trip to the Inn Intrinsic before heading on to Vesper.
All right, here we are, and they're selling keys here at 60 gold pieces for six of them. That's a good enough deal, so let's go ahead and stock up. We've got enough gold to pick up keys to last us to the end of the game. Well, it hit the end again while we're here. Can't beat the price. And now we can move on to our next step, checking out some of the locked doors we've been avoiding so far, specifically in Castle Britannia and Paws. Visiting the prison first, we find a number of prisoners and an evil-looking tree called a Reaper. We also encounter our first locked doors. The command to bypass them is J for Jimmy, leading to believe that the magic key might just be a euphemism for lockpick. None of the prisoners here have anything useful to tell us. They don't even have individual stories that add to the game. And there's no obvious way to reach the evil tree, so we'll have to find some secret passageways. They're easy to overlook. There's just one misplaced brick, Unless you watch the walls carefully as you go, then they tend to stick out a bit. Here's our first, leading us to a seemingly dead-end corridor with more secret doors ahead and to the side. We take the stairs and find a few more locked doors leading to a secret passage allowing us to access the Reaper. We are, thankfully, in no danger here. The Reaper tells us of a thing that can kill many and suggests that we can learn about it in Buccaneer's Den, the same place that we were sent to learn about Mondane's Skull. I tell it we won't look for the skull, but I'm lying. We're totally going to go get it. Using another key brings us to the wizard Zorin, who tells us to seek help in the Lyceum, Empath Abbey, and Serpent's Castle. Three castles that are devoted not to virtues, but to the principles that build them up, truth, love, and courage. You might call them a Triforce of Principles, perhaps. He further tells us to find everyone named Antos and ask of the Bell, Book, and Candle. Those who watched my video on Ultima 2 might remember the main quest's focal point for a long time was looking on different planets for Father Antos, and that he popped up in Ultima 3 as well. Bell, Book, and Candle as objects have shown up in Zork and Nethack. They're part of the Catholic Church's excommunication ritual. One last stop, we head into what might be a cistern and meet a shepherd. She hails from Magicinia and gives us the ruins, latitude, and longitude. We don't have the sextant yet, but it'll be a good idea to write that down for later. Finally, we head out behind the castle and run into Landry, who warns us about some kind of peril ahead. We'll be back, but we're nowhere ready to tackle what lies just past him. Not quite yet. On the side of the castle, we find Joshua, who tells us a riddle. This is part of a long quest line that, unfortunately, went unfinished when they pushed Ultima 4 into production. More onto that later. A quick stop in Britain to buy some food, and we're off to pause to see a horse. Snakes are one of the few animals that count as non-evil, and it's good to let them retreat when they can, because it's considered non-virtuous to kill them, even if they started it. It's also a sin against Valor to run away, so just kind of hope you don't hit them too hard so they can't try and escape. Back in pause, and we're going to pass on through the stables to unlock the door to the paddock. We are immediately attacked by a bull. This is a bad scene, so we retreat. It's a Valor hit, but we avoid a Compassion hit, and we don't want to have to meditate to regain it. I'm also not entirely sure that the guards wouldn't attack us if we defended ourselves here. The other bull ignores us, and we go on to the back paddock where the horses are. Francesca asks if we're here to steal a horse. We tell her we aren't. So we must be here to see Smith. Who is Smith? Well, he's a talking horse. More importantly, Smith is part of that unfinished quest line, and was intended to give the player the explicit answer to the final riddle in the game, the one we're unscrambling with the letters given from each shrine. Unfortunately, that answer was never implemented. 
Smith will instead give us the answer when we meet him in Ultima 5, launching a running gag in which the horse provides some vital clue that would have been useful in the last game. That's the bulk of what we needed here in the mainland, it's time to hit the islands. In the first few games, we'd had to grind for a pirate ship, a tedious process made more obnoxious by being beholden to the wind, so for this playthrough we're going to start off using moon gates instead. Moon gates work much like they did in Ultima 3. Each appears at a specific phase of the left moon, with its destination determined by the right moon, cycling between three different places to end up. Each gate appears near a city, making gate-to-gate -gate hops even easier. The destinations are more regular in Ultima 4, though, always taking us somewhere near a settlement, turning them into something closer to a transit network instead of portals to the unknown. It's part of the way in which Lord British has pacified Britannia. Our jump, from the gate near Trinsic, passing through when the right moon is new, will take us to Moonglow, where we started the game, but ignored because we wanted to hurry up and get our quest from Lord British. We can wait by using the Z command. Turns won't pass, our food won't be consumed, but the moon phases will still cycle. The greeter here tells us that the shrine is off on an island to the north, and, jokes on us, we'll need a pirate ship to get there. I guess there's no escaping that pirate grind. Browning here asks if we've never lied. I'm not sure if he's looking for a yes or a no. It's Shakespeare. Yes, that Shakespeare, another famous name dropped from Richard Garriott. Our dying friend Shazam here is apprenticed to the great wizard Nigel up at the Lycinium, the castle dedicated to the Principle of Truth. He lets slip that Nigel has created the spell Recall, which is really the resurrection spell, another hidden one that we can learn from its creator. Fortunately, the Lyceum is here on the Verity Islands. This kid here, William, is kind enough to give us a bite of his peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I don't know what that's about, but it just about made my day. Just a really nice little touch. Cosima, unexpectedly, tells us that we only need a single spider silk to cast the sleep spell. And many of you viewers out there were kind enough to tell me in the comments of the part one of the video that I'd been mispronouncing reagents. It's one of those words that I'd only ever read and never had a cause to, you know, say out loud or had said to me. Thank you for the correction and let me know if there are any other words that I mispronounce. We tell the paladin Cromwell here that we strive to be honest, and in exchange he tells us of the Shrine of Honesty's mantra, Om. Our honesty virtue is maxed out now, we made sure of that when we were grinding honor and pause by buying reagents but for their exact value. There's another charming kid in the inn. Kristen insists that we're friends. Okay, works for me. He goes on to tell us that William, the kid who gave me a bite of his sandwich, knows where the honesty rune is, so it's back to William. I try to ask him about Christian and friends first, but there's no response, which is too bad. A little more effort, a few more keywords would have added a lot more vermicillitude to a lot of these conversations. They are a big improvement from Ultima 3, but I don't feel like we have the conversational system being exploited to its full potential here. William does tell me to search for the Rune of Honesty by Mariah's Gold. We find Mariah in the northwest corner. Most of the time, in most playthroughs, she is a recruitable companion, but this run I'm playing a mage, and in any given playthrough you can never recruit the character who shares her class. She does have a chest here, but taking it would violate our honesty. Instead, we have to be careful to press S to search to find the rune, instead of G to get. And that's it for Moonglow. The Lyceum, the first of our castles dedicated to the principles of truth, love, and courage, is on the other end of the Verity Isles. We've been sent here for a few reasons. First, to seek out those named Antos for the Bell, Book, and Candle, 
And secondly, Shazam's teacher Nigel developed the resurrection spell. The Lyceum is all about truth, according to the people we meet here. We meet Nigel down in the corner tower, and he asks if we know his specialty. Shazam called it Recall. Nigel clarifies what it does and tells us that it requires ash, ginseng, garlic, silk, blood moss, and mandrake. That is a lot, including the reagent we can't buy, mandrake, which must be harvested from a small number of specific swamps under a double new moon. It'll be tremendously useful when we have a full party. In the Lyceum throne room, we meet Rob and Beth Fraser, the Baron and Baroness. They don't add much to the story or have anything to tell us at the moment, but we'll be back to talk to them later. We're about to leave when the Jester pops through a secret door we hadn't noticed. It leads to a room full of treasure chests, which we are not going to steal, but I do want to talk to him. This turns out to be one of the few situations where health gets a useful response. Zajac is unhappy because Chuckles, the Jester in Castle Britain, won't tell him his secret. We make a note to have a word with the Jester next time we're passing through. After assuring the guard that we're not going to steal any gold, we head west and meet Lord Terence, the Librarian. The Lyceum, apparently, holds the largest store of knowledge in Britannia except for the Codex. He asks if we're looking for a specific book. We are, but we don't know the title, so he invites us to browse. The concept of browsing is meaningless, however, with Ultima 4's interface. The library is also confusing at first glance. There are shelves for A, E, I, N, R, and V, but that doesn't mean much to us at the moment. We leave at this point, entirely forgetting to look for Antos and missing a whole wing of the keep, but that's not a problem because we'll be back sooner or later. I admit I'm a bit preoccupied because now we need a ship to get to the Shrine of Honesty, and like in the first three Ultima games, the only way to get a ship is to steal one from pirates. It isn't really less of a tedious slog this time around, but it's the first time I find myself getting bored in Ultima 4. We don't really have any kind of alternative, though. The northeast part of the island is the only real place to try and get one to spawn. The rest of the coast is shallows where ships can't go. The seas in Ultima 4 have their own terrain for the first time, which is nice. While I grind, one comment I got about Part 1 sticks out with me. James Potts mentioned that this style of analytical playthrough does not convey the sense of wonder players had when playing the game for the first time. And that's true, that's fair. These videos are less about the experience of discovering the game, and more about taking the game and carefully examining it. It's maybe a little more academic than subjective. There is a lot of value to be had in the style that emphasizes that sense of discovery, the emotional trip report style, even if you're more interested in what playing these older games was like, instead of what they were about. But I think that that would have to be a different video entirely. I don't think I could try to recapture that sense of awe and wonder, that fresh first-time playthrough, while simultaneously holding it at the distance required for a fair analysis. That being said, if you would like to see me do another series where I play these games in a more uh, organic fashion, let me know in the comments. I don't know that I'll have the time right now. I basically have to treat the channel like a full-time job and it's not bringing in full-time money for me. Uh, but if you want to help out there, consider becoming a channel member. If I get enough to do this full-time, I will absolutely make both kinds of video. A pirate ship finally spawns and since I'm still solo, I easily overpower the two pirates on board. Note that we can't bring our horse on the ship. So we'll have to leave it here and sail north, through this channel, to the shrine. We meditate, we chant, we get a vision, another I. That's three I's and two N's in this eight-letter word. That kind of narrows it down a bit. We now have compassion, sacrifice, honor, justice, and honesty. That's more than halfway to Avatar. We'll sail back to Verity, moor the ship, jump on our horse, and ride back to the Moongate. It drops us back near Castle Britain. 
After visiting Lord British to heal up, we check in with Hawkwind. Humility is maxed out, but we still need more Valor and Spirituality. Fortunately, those will rise naturally with time, Valor as we kill monsters, and Spirituality every time we hit a shrine or check in with Hawkwind. We remember to talk to Chuckles and ask him about his secret. He tells us to speak unto the waters of the well and ask of the altars. This is a bit cryptic until we remember that secret room full of water in the back of the castle. He won't elaborate, even to say that he won't elaborate, so we head back through the secret doors and, well, talk to the water. Surprisingly, it responds. Water's secret is that the three altar rooms connect to the bottom levels of all eight dungeons. It's really kind of an interesting design. When we hit the eighth floor of a dungeon, you can leave and ascend back up through other dungeons. We're still a ways away from delving into any, but it'll make the job a lot easier in the long run. This leaves us with the question of what the water even is within the context of the game. Is it an elemental? A spirit? Just sentient water? Who knows? We're never going to get an answer. We're going back to target Valor next, but we'll need to stock up on reagents and paws first. Garlic, Ash, and Black Pearl for the Dispel spell, which will help us get rid of magical barriers, and Ginsig and Silk for heal spells. We largely haven't bothered with spells to restore our hit points so far, but it might be convenient to have a few on hand just in case. Jellum is the city of Valor, and it's not an... Jellum, the city of Valor, is also on an island, so we'll need to take Moon Gates to get there, the easiest way being through the gate near you. We're running a bit low on food, so we'll take an opportunity to stock up along the way. The Yu Moon Gate is in a clearing northwest of the city, and jumping through it takes us to this peninsula. Jellum is a walled city filled with fighters. Here we meet a guy named X who is looking for the Redstone of Valor. He mentions, offhandedly, that the Redstone is used to get the third part of a key, the first time someone explicitly mentioned what the stones are used for. In the Armory, we meet Sir Hrothgar, named after a king in Beowulf, who is also the inspiration for High Hrothgar in Skyrim. The king, that is, not this guy. When we admit that we're not the most valorous, which would ding our humility if we pretended we were, he tells us to seek out the Shrine of Valor and that Aesop knows the mantra. We find Aesop hiding in some bushes. He tells us that it's easy to be brave from a safe distance, a coward in the city of Valor. He tells us that the mantra is Ra, and that the shrine is on the next aisle. This is one of the few examples of a character who is not a virtuous person. Uh, we do get a few of these now and again, Aesop and the horse thief come to mind, but not so many that you can understand why Lord British is so worried about the ethical well-being of his people. By and large, everyone we visit in each town is a shining example of that vir town's virtue. In the inn, we use a magic key to Jimmy Locke and find Sir Robert. He is able to point us to Nostro, who knows of the rune. We find Geoffrey in another room. He's the Valor Companion. Strong, not too quick, and we'll get around to him later. That's everywhere in town, but we haven't seen Nostro. To find him, we'll have to get into the walls, and for that, there is a secret door in Sir Robert's room. In the walls, we find our way blocked by magical fields. Not poison, not sleep, just barriers. So we'll need our Dispel spell to bypass them. Good thing we stocked up, because otherwise we'd have to go all the way back to the mainland to buy reagents. We first encounter Sonora, who has been banished to the tower for her crimes. She won't elaborate on to what they are, but is kind enough to tell us that we need a sextant and directs us to the barkeep to learn more. We maneuver past her and talk to the barkeep. He tells us that we can get an, a sextant in guild shops by asking for the unlisted item D. That's a clever puzzle, hiding an important item in plain sight like it's a secret option on a fast food menu. We head back to the walls and make our way through, dispelling barriers until we find Nostro, who apparently has been walled in after they built the place. 
Again, he won't tell us why, but I don't get the feeling like he's an innocent victim here. He tells us that the ruin is hidden in one of the towers, and we find it in the southeast. Nostro follows us the rest of the way out, but no one seems to care. You kind of kind of be careful with, uh, with these followers who cling to you so tightly, because you can't pass through them. It would be very easy to get stuck in a one-way passage. To get to the Shrine of Valor, we're going to need a ship, and rather than grind another pirate, let's take the Moon Gate back to Moonglow. Once here, we ride up and swap out our horse for the ship, and sail east and then south through the shrine. Sailing is... well, this is where the wind mechanic comes into play. Essentially, if we try to sail into the wind, we stop and don't move again until the wind shifts. It's not an obstacle, it's not a puzzle, it's a minor irritation and inconvenience that makes travel by sea just slightly more obnoxious, and it's a weird bit of realism that I don't feel really adds much to the experience of playing the game. Unlike other obstacles, there's nothing to discover here, just a momentary eye roll. The difficult terrain on land, hills, forests, works somewhat the same way, slowing your travel, but there the pause and traversal at least gives you a feel that breaks up the experience in a tactile way. Traveling over the plains is smooth. Over hill and through forest is more difficult, not mechanically, because moving tile to tile is moving tile to tile, but it gives a sense of narrative character to the journey. Not so with the wind. The wind just sucks. We meditate, we get our vision, this time the symbol for infinity, and we are three quarters done. We just need humility and spirituality. At this point we could switch back to mo using moon gates, but we might as well stick with the ship for a while. We know how to get the sextant and we have the coordinates from Maginicea, but since the island is a straight shot from here and in the interest of brevity, I'm just going to head right over. Maginicea was a town destroyed by pride, and now inhabited chiefly by ghosts and undead that, for the most part, won't attack you. The biggest danger here are the poison swamp tiles. It otherwise reminds me of Damdara, the ruined city in Dragon Quest, which would be released in 1986. While it's a well-known fact that Enix was inspired by Ultima, it's unlikely that there's a direct parallel here. Quest of the Avatar wouldn't be ported to Japanese computers until 1987, and even if Yuji Horii got his hands on an Apple II import, that's a very short development time before the game's release. We're here for a few things. The Humility Mantra is the Pride Mantra backwards, for example. Most of the dead simply feel sorry for themselves, but Splot the Skeleton espouses the virtues of humility and tells us to ask the snake about the rune and stone. Since he's right here, we do. Nate the Snake. His job is to bring death to all in Magencia, but he's cool enough to point us to barons and paws when we ask him about the rune, and to ask in the pub in Britain about the black stone. He attacks us when we try to leave, but we get him to run. Despite his aggressive nature, Nate is a snake, and thus, not evil. Casperin, haunting the armor shop, directs us to Haywood for the mantra. Haywood is, of course, haunting the weapon shop. He doesn't actually know the mantra, though, pointing us instead to Faultless. For his part, Faultless is behind the shop counter. He lets us in on the knowledge that the mantra for pride is Mole, making humility mantra Lum. Before we leave, up in the corner we run into a trio of skeletons, Banter, Weirdrum, and Dimitri. Collectively, they tell us about a silver horn used to pass by the demons guarding the Shroud of Humility. If you remember in Part 1, we learned about the shrine in Vesper, guarded by an entire horde of demons. Dimitri tells us that the Queen of Love has a lady-in-waiting who can tell us of the horn. Love is one of the three principles and tied to Empath Abbey, so we'll find this queen and her lady there. Finished in Magencia, we sail west until we hit the mainland, then divert south to pause to ask Baron about the Humility Rune. We'll stock up on some curious spells while we're here. After some searching, we find Baron hidden away in a back corner. He tells us that the rune is hidden in the hills in the southeast corner of Paws, and we go look for it. The NPC Wheatpin is there to give us clearer directions, which is an unexpectedly nice touch of interactivity.
We sail back to the mainland and, uh, seeing that we're nearly level 6, get in a few fights before visiting Lord British. He elevates us, then we head northwest to Empath Abbey, just to the west of the Yu Moon Gate. As the Lyceum was to truth, so Empath Abbey is to love. They have their own Baron and Baroness, Robert and Marcy. Robert doesn't have much to offer us, but Marcy tells us that the people of the Abbey believe in love and live it to their fullest. Just off the throne room is the grove where, according to Diane, you can find insight into love within yourself or the others present. This is starting to sound a little bit like a cult, but there's nothing salacious going. Just people musing on about love and its relationship to the other virtues. After leaving, we find Brother Antos in the southeast corner. He doesn't know anything about the bell or book, but tells us that we need the candle of love to enter the abyss, and further tells us to meditate at their love shrine to find it. Nearby we find Suzanne, a lady-in-waiting, the one we're here to ask about the horn. She directs us to the paladin named Melkor, who we find at the healers. Melkor, in turn, tells us the rumor that the horn is buried on a small isle off the tip of the spirit wood. Good thing we brought our ship. We head back to Lord British to heal up, then take the ship around to the archipelago south of Skara Bray. It's a large island chain, and there's really no faster way to find the horn than just searching each and every tile until we find it. Now that we've got it, we sail due west until we reach the Isle of the Abyss. And once here, we will need to use the horn to keep the demons at bay, because if they get us, we'll be trapped in a chain of battles with no easy way out. Not that they're difficult, just that they keep coming if we win. What they don't tell you, unfortunately, is that you need to keep blowing the horn every so often because the effects wear off. If you get caught up in battles, there's no recourse but to exit the game and restore your last save. When we make our way to the shrine, we meditate on humility and we get our CG. Seven down, one virtue to go, spirituality. For that, we need to sail east to the archipelago and then up to Scarabray. Towns named Scarabray appear in two of the other big CRPGs of the era as well, Wizardry and Bard's Tale. All three of them are named after a prehistoric village discovered in northern Scotland. Right off the bat, we meet Granted the Beggar. In exchange for help, he tells us that the Ankh knows of the rune and that Ambule knows the mantra. This will be helpful. Inside, the first person we meet is Shimino, the name under which Richard Gary participated in the Society for Creative Anachronism and another potential recruit. Shimino and some others are clustered around an Ankh, and we can talk to it like it's a character. It tells us, straight up, that it keeps the secret of the rune, though it asks us the mantra before it'll tell us. We instead talk to Carlisle to the north, who tells us that the magic missile spell requires not two, but one ash to cast. On the right of the Ankh is Dickens. Charles Dickens, the author, another random anachronism. We find Ambule begging next to the herb store. He directs us to Baron, not the same Baron we met in Paws. This is a kid, maybe Baron Jr. Mitre tells us that the White Stone is no longer in Dungeon Hithloth, and points us to the pub Intrinsic. We find Baron, and he's able to tell us that the mantra is Om. Knowing this, we head back to the Ankh, which reveals that the Rune of Spirituality is in the Treasury of Britannia, and that to get to the Shrine, we'll need to enter the Gate of Full Moons. Only one Moon Gate opens at that point, and we'll have to find out which one it is, though the map is a big help. Heading east, we run into Buddha. Yes, that Buddha. Another tribute from Richard Garriott. The philosopher Santayana is a little further on, in the inn, along with Michelangelo, the artist, not the Ninja Turtle, though that wouldn't surprise me either. We were seeing celebrity cameos all the way back in Ultima 2 with Warren Beatty in Pirate's Harbor. Anyway, we're done with Scar Bray, so we sail back to Lord British. After a quick conversational heal, we make our way to his hidden treasure room and search it until we find the rune, careful not to accidentally steal anything. We hop back in our boat east and head back to the Moon Gate near Minoc. At the full moon, it opens up to the Secret Shine. And like that, we've mastered all eight of the virtues. We're not done yet. We still need to retrieve the Codex from the Abyss and recruit our eight companions, which we will do, but first I want to accomplish as much as I can solo, 
just so that the combats don't drag on forever. Remember, the number of foes we face is based on our party size. No, you might be asking, won't I need to grind to level up my party members? Yes, but only to something like level 3 or 4 or 5, and when I get to that point, more enemies will mean more chances to earn XP, not just longer fights I need to sit through. A few NPCs have directed us to visit a village beyond Lock Lake. Lock Lake is that big inland lake near the Shrine of Compassion, and we're going to need a ship to cross it, but unfortunately, pirate ships hardly ever spawn on Lock Lake. So how do we get there? Well, in a callback to Ultima 3, we need to sail into a whirlpool, which means we get in our boat and sail around until we find it. How do I know this? Well, the Nintendo port gives us some hints by the way of helpful NPCs, but in the other computer ports, we're not so lucky. I suppose if you'd played 3, you might try it to see what happened, but otherwise you'd just have been caught by it and found yourself there, on the lake. So I try. And I try. Oh my god, do I try and I grind for a long, long time to find that whirlpool, but I cannot for the life of me track it down. I even head up to Vesper and buy some magic gems to help give me a bird's eye view of the sea, but it's no good. I just can't find it. There is, however, another way there if you know approximately where to go. The blink spell will teleport you a distance in a direction selected, and if you stand right here near the Shrine of Compassion and blink east, it'll send you to the right to the shore near Cove. However, leaving requires another two blink spells, and you cannot buy reagents in Cove, so if you don't have them when you arrive, well, you're stuck there until you starve to death. This has the further disadvantage of not leaving you with a ship on the lake to ferry back if you ever need to visit it again, but you can always just buy more blood moss and spider silk if that comes up. Just make sure to bring enough for the return trip. We find Mentorian right away, and because we have the Ankh, he's all too willing to tell us the recipe for the gate spell. Ash, Pearl, and Mandrake root. We now know all of the spells we'll need as soon as we get a supply of Mandrake. Shaman here mentions the one pure axiom that is the secret to the Codex, and this is tied to that unfinished quest chain. Brother Zare tells us about the word. Don't you know about the word? Well, the kings of Lyceum, Serpent's Castle, and Empath Abbey each know one syllable of the word of passage that we'll need to enter the abyss. So we'll need to visit each of them and ask. In the shrine here, we find another Ankh that we can talk to. There's a few of these scattered around the world, and nobody ever remarks upon it or offers an explanation as to why they can speak. It's just an accepted part of the setting. It asks us for our thoughts on what we need help with, so we'll have to come back once someone directs us here. In the healers, we find the real-world Bengali philosopher Rabindranath Tagore. More obscure than some of the other historical figures that Richards has inserted into his game, but probably one more foundational to his efforts to understand Hindu spiritualism. Just around the corner, we find the much more well-known mu musicians Paul and Linda McCartney singing about love. So, yeah, we got that going for us. We finally find someone willing to point us to the shrine when we meet the seahorse Blissful, who tells us the Ankh knows how to enter the chamber of the Codex. But first we stumble across the hidden child, Alan, who lets us know that to enter the Abyss, a ship must have a magically strengthened hull. He sends us back to Blissful, who tells us to meditate at the Shrine of Honesty, Compassion, and Valor to know how to enter the Abyss. Back to the Ankh. It tells us to enter the Codex Chamber, we must be eight parts Avatar, check, have the key of three parts, not yet, and know the word of passage and of the pure axiom. So that's most of what we'll need for the endgame. And that's all we need from Cove for now, so we blink back west, twice, to get back to the main continental area. Again, if we didn't have the spells prepped or the reagents to mix, we'd be trapped here until we starve to death. There are no reagent shops in Cove. Since we're officially the Avatar now, we're going to head back to Paws to check in with Sir Simon and Lady Tessa. They are now all too happy to tell us where to find the mystic weapons and armor. The armor is in the center of an oak grove, and the weapons are in the training room of Serpent Castle. 
We haven't been to the castle yet, but we did run across an oak grove in Empath Abbey. While we're here, we're going to go ahead and buy reagents and mix up some more blink spells to replace those we used getting to Cove. Empath Abbey is on the mainland, so that's a good first target. We can get the armor and learn the syllable all in one trip. We can just head straight to the throne room, where we can ask Sir Robert about the word. He gives us the syllable Amo. From here, we head into the Oak Grove, searching until we find the Mystic Armor. And I mean eight sets, one for every potential party member. It makes a fine replacement for our cloth robe, our starter armor that served us well so far. I talk to Brother Antos again, and again I'm told that to find the Candle of Love I should meditate in the shrine. So I go and I talk to the Ankh, now that I know I can talk to Ankhs, and it tells me that it is life, and asks me if I have the candle. I don't, so it tells me to ask the Bard beyond the secret passage. Most likely place for a secret passage in any castle is the throne room, and yes, I find one here. Following it, I eventually find Derek the Bard, who tells me the Candle of Love is hidden in a secret place off of Lock Lake. So it's back to Cove, I guess. We have enough blink spells for one more trip, and hopefully this will be the last time we need to visit. We are here for one reason and one reason only. Find the Candle of Love. We check the shrine and notice a secret door, so we jump through flames to check it out. It leads us to a small alcove, and at the end we find the candle. We blink out, return to the coast, grab our ship, and head towards the Verity Isles to return to the Lyceum. Last time we were here, we forgot to look for Father Antos and we skipped an entire wing of the castle, but this time we find him and learn that the book we're looking for is the Book of Truth. That gives us something to go off of when we visit the librarian and ask about it. He tells us, of course, to look under T. The shelves we have here are labeled A, E, I, N, R, V, so T would be between V and R. We take a look, we search, and there it is. We could have found this earlier if we'd searched every space on the floor, basically searching the shelves. Book tucked under our arm, we visit Lord Rob to get his syllable, Ver. We have Amo and Ver. Veramo? I'm over? We don't know, and we won't know until we get the third syllable from the castle we haven't visited yet. Serpent Castle, the Dominion of Courage. There's no moon gate that'll take us there, but we can sail there normally. It's on its own massive island. We make landfall, we enter, and we encounter a glitch, our first in the game. This guard here, for some reason, is giving us the dialogue from the Lord of the Castle. It's a strange bug that we don't want to interface with, so we move on to talk to the actual guy. Sentry was a character we first encountered in Ultima 2 in the city of New San Antonio, where we broke into his prison cell and bought his Quick Blade, the best weapon in the game. Here he gives us the third syllable, Kor, so we have Ver, Amo, and Kor. There aren't any English words we can make out of these, but they're all based on the Latin associated with each Baron's principle. Ver for Veritas, Amo for Amor, and, well, Courage for Kor. I don't know why Garriott broke the pattern and didn't use, say, four for Fortis, but the point is that the word of passage we need is probably just something he made up. Passing through the obligatory secret treasure chamber, we run into Sister Antos and ask her about the bell. She directs us to the fighter Gargan, who can help us find it. First, though, out beyond the castle, we run into Noxum, a friendly Nixie. When she asks us if we've heard of the HMS Cape, we lie and say we have. Okay, it's not exactly a lie, because she already mentioned it, so we heard about it from her. Uh, and she tells us about a magical wheel that strengthened its hull. And this reminds us of what that kid Alan said about needing a strengthened hull to enter the abyss. Looking for Gargan brings us to the training room, where we talk to the trainer and trainees, and they give us information that the red, orange, purple, and white stones will be used in the Altar Room of Courage. Remembering Lady Tessa's clue, we also search and find the mystic weapons here. Unlike the mystic armor, though, we're not going to equip this right away. They're swords, melee weapons, and while powerful, our sling is still the way to go for ranged weapon supremacy. That is correct. In Ultima IV's combat system, the weakest ranged weapon is preferable to the strongest melee weapon. A sailor in the healer's room tells us more about the HMS Cape. It apparently went down in the deep waters of the bay in the Cape of Heroes. 
We make a note of that, because salvaging its magical wheel sounds like a good plan and necessary for the endgame. We finally found Gargan hanging out in an empty room in the southeast part of the keep. He tells us that the bell is located at the bottom of a deep sea well and gives us the longitude and latitude. So that's two more treasures we need to dive for. Using the description in the Book of History, we're able to make a good run at figuring out where the Cape of Heroes is, and therefore the bay. A little searching turns up the wheel, and using it with the use command bulks our hull points from 50 to 99. This is a mechanic that I haven't touched on yet. Every time you get a ship, it has 50 hull points to start, and enemies that shoot on you on the world map lower this. If it hits zero, the ship sinks and you die, same as if you'd run out of hit points or food. Those threats haven't been very common so far, so it hasn't mattered, but going forward, this will be necessary to bulk up for the endgame. For the bell, we're going to need the sextant, so we sail to the northeast mainland and stop near Vesper. A reminder that it's a secret menu item in the guild shop, item D, and we can have one for 900 gold. We're still swimming in coins thanks to never needing to upgrade our equipment, so it's a done deal. Back at sea, the L key lets us locate our position with a longitude and latitude made up of letters. The Ultima 4 map does not, alas, have longitudinal and latitudinal markings, so we're going to have to figure out how to use it by means of dead reckoning. We are currently at EA and ME, and the bell is at NALA. Since we know that the C is a two-dimensional plane, we can think of the coordinates as a grid with an X and Y axis. EA, our latitude, specifies our north-south, or y-axis. Each tile we travel increments the second letter in a pairing, currently A, and when we run out of letters, it increments the first letter, the E. So to go from EA to NA, we have to go quite a way south, and to go from ME to LA, we have to go just a bit west. So we go west a bit and check out our positioning, EAO and LA, so we're directly due north of where we want to be, and it's time to strike out against the open sea. This procedure is basically a simple form of dead reckoning, an ancient sailing technique that used to measure based on speed using knotted rope, hence the nautical measurement of knots. We eventually come to an area of shallows, a submerged volcano maybe, with a conspicuous tile of deep water right in the middle. We zero in on it, search, and we find our bell. For both this and the discovery of the wheel, we can imagine jumping off the boat and free diving to the ocean floor to a tremendous depth, but the game doesn't go into any kind of detail, maybe that's a missed opportunity. A trip back to Lord British has us level up to 7, almost maxed out. All that's left to tackle the end game is to hit the dungeons, collecting the stones we'll need to get the parts of the key, and to recruit our crew. Since we're only level 7, we can hold off on recruitment for now. Since our party size is limited to our level, we would need to leave someone out, and that bothers me. I'm mostly sure that we can handle a dungeon solo. We've been fine so far, but unlike the rest of the game, the dungeons have rooms that are essentially set fights that don't scale to your party size. They'll be the same, no matter who you have with you, and you can't avoid most of them. So this might kill me. Uh, Death in Ultima 4 isn't too painful, you lose some of your coins and whatever possessions you have that aren't equipped, gear, or quest items, but I've avoided it so far and I'd like to keep avoiding it. But, you know, we'll see how it goes. So, each of the dungeons is connected to the other dungeons at the bottom level via an altar room that maps to Courage, Truth, or Love, and we unlock the corresponding part of the key by using the associated virtues colored stones in the right room. And where are these stones? Well, most of them are hidden in the dungeons, with the exception of the Black Stone of Humility and the White Stone of Spirituality, which we were told was missing from the dungeon Hithloth. Isaac of Scarabray told us that this stone was hidden atop the Serpent Spine Mountains. To get the White Stone, we're still going to need to go into the dungeon Hithloth because that's the only way to get the means to get to the top of the Serpent Spine Mountains. Sort of and it'll get us the XP we need to get to level 8 and recruit everybody. Before we head out though, we're going to get some supplies. We're going to want plenty of spells, uh, light so we can see, cure to deal with poison, dispel to get around energy fields, and wind to make things easier after we get out. That's a lot more ominous than it sounds. 
A quick trip to pause and we buy enough ash, ginseng, garlic, pearl, and moss for our needs, mix up some cure, light, dispel, and wind spells. We're also going to head over to Vesper to grab some magic gems. 20 should cover the rest of the game in case we get lost. Most of the dungeons are easy to find, but Dungeon Hithloth can only be entered from the bottom of a different dungeon, or through a secret door back behind Castle Britannia. Well, it's secret, but it's not too hard to stumble upon. Thing is, once you enter through the secret passage, the only way out is through. So, here we are, in the dungeon. At first glance, it's the same as dungeons were in the first three games. A first-person maze that we need torches or light spells to navigate. Ahead, we can see a barrier. These are what we'll need to use our Dispel spells on. At the top of the screen, we can see what level we're on, and the bottom is our heading. We don't need to go through this barrier, so we're just going to descend the ladder. All the way down to the bottom. This is the secret entrance, after all. And from here, we can access all the other altar rooms and thus any of the dungeons, at least after we have all the stones. Instead, we're going to find another ladder up and leave Hithloth through its main entrance, which we normally cannot reach on the overworld map. Using one of our gems shows us the floor, where that shield, the up brackets or fields we'll need to dispel, and the up arrow is the stairs. And those squares? Well, those are the set fight rooms I told you about. Note that the dungeon floor isn't that big. None of them are, but they can tile in weird ways. Here we go south, to spell the poison field, and run into gazers, powerful monsters that can put us to sleep. These aren't a set encounter, so there are only two of them, and despite being knocked to sleep, we managed to beat them all with our sling. Did the gazers look familiar? Like Dungeons and Dragons beholders? Well, at least Origin is savvy enough to try and conceal the ripping off D&D by Ultima 4. We ascend to the 7th floor, and without further incident, up to the 6th. And we find our first room. It is absolutely packed with monsters, but aside from the Zorn, not a big threat to us. We clear them out, some escape, and collect the treasures, one of which is a tile that opens a secret door. That's the thing with these rooms. The direction we exit them matters, because that's where we're spit back out into the dungeon. Or, as in this case, into another room, filled with enemy mages and a barrier we needed to spell. From here, we find yet a third linked room, home to some wisps and a reaper. We kill them and discover that some of the chests they were guarding are actually mimics, but they're not that hard to kill either. Now we're out of the rooms and back into the dungeon, where we encounter first a reaper and then some gremlins. Unlike the earlier monsters, gremlins are a threat. They don't hurt us, they steal our food and we only carry so much. Starving to death is many times worse than poisoning, and there are no spells to feed you in Ultima 4. Two we can handle, and though and we move on. A few rooms later, though, and we're faced with a huge group. True to form, they steal all of our food before we can kill them, and the dungeon becomes a race between our hit points and how far we still have to go. This is, without a doubt, the most dangerous situation I've found myself in, in during this playthrough. The fights get easier as we continue to ascend, but we are constantly leaking hit points due to starvation, and I begin to wonder if this is really going to be the playthrough's first death. I am lucky enough to find a fountain that restores my hit points up on the third level, but I'm still down to 410 by the time I find my way out. We're in an otherwise inaccessible valley that contains only one other things of interest. A hot air balloon. I hate that balloon. So, in the balloon, there are only two controls, ascend and descend. And beyond that, you drift where the wind blows you. That's good enough to get out of the valley, and we're able to land near Vesper and buy some food so we're no longer starving, but it's a terrible way to try and travel somewhere specific. In Ultima 2, there was a space shuttle that you could not control that only orbited over the world map, and you had to try and land it somewhere safe or die, and this is worse. At least an orbital trajectory is predictable. Here, if you shift directions when the wind demands, even casting a wind spell only gives you a few seconds worth of control. And where do we need to go in our balloon? 
we need to land in a single Talil Valley at the top of the Serpent Spine Mountains. Friends, viewers, I tried to make this happen for days before giving up. I don't know if it's impossible or if there's a trick to controlling it I don't know, or if modern computers are just too fast for ballooning. I could not do it. Thankfully, as with trying to find the Whirlpool, I had Blink to fall back on. Stand just to the south here, blink north, and you end up smack dab in the valley. Search it, and you find the white stone. We're almost at level 8, so we are almost ready to recruit our party. First thing though, I want to get a source of nightshade that we'll need for the gate and resurrection spells. We already basically know where, and in the middle of a field we find a single tile of swamp, wait around for a double new moon, search and get our reagent. Resurrect spells let us bring dead companions back, uh, something Lord British won't do for us. It's useful mid-dungeon, and because the number of foes we face in a random encounter aren't lessened if some of our friends are dead. We will need Ash, Ginseng, Garlic, Silk, Blood Moss, and Mandrake. Gate travel lets us teleport from the outdoors to any town. Normally, I'd prefer to walk so we can get in fights and build XP, but there are times you might be trapped somewhere and Blink won't do it for you. For this, we need Ash, Pearl, and Mandrake Root. A fun tip, if you save the game and reload, the moon states aren't preserved, they default back to new, so you can just search again and get as much Mandrake as you want. After this, we head back to Paws to get the other reagents we'll need, 10 Ash, 5 Ginseng, 5 Garlic, 5 Silk, 5 Blood Moss, and 5 Black Pearl gets us enough for 5 castings of each spell. The last thing I want to do is tackle the Skull of Mondaine. This is an optional side quest, the first truly optional quest we've seen in the series, and you can totally skip doing it, but for our analysis, we're going to collect it. We travel to Buccaneer's Den, the only city we haven't visited, and look for the pub where we can ask the bartender about the skull. The bartender directs us back to see Jude in Minoc, the guy who had some terrible sin he refused to elaborate on, so off we go. This time, when we question him directly about the skull, he reveals that he used it, and offers to help us only if we swear to use it in the mouth of the Abyss to destroy it. We agree. He gives us a latitude and longitude, adding that it can only be found on the darkest night. We sail off, use the coordinates given, find a spot between three volcanic islands, idle around until both moons are new, and we find the skull of Mondane the Wizard, big boss of Ultima One. I like to imagine it rising from the depths of the sea, bathed in ethereal light. Now what does the skull do? It tempts us. It is a powerful combat item, but using it sets back all of our virtues. The Reaper, imprisoned in Castle Britain, told us that it causes destruction. Jude asks us to destroy it in the mouth of the Abyss. Ragnar warned that it will eliminate our virtues. If used in the vicinity of living beings, everybody dies except Lord British. This is almost, almost a case of a branching storyline. The player using the skull causes mass murder and has all of his virtues reset, requiring us to build, rebuild our moral character. Of course, it doesn't cause a permanent change in the game state, because we can just build up our virtues again, collect the skull again if we want to, and even the dead NPCs come back to life. Nobody even remembers that we did this. So, we'll take the path of destroying the skull instead because there's no strong benefit or long-term narrative impact from using it. For now, let's reload our save to before we use the skull and go get our companions now that we're level 8. We find Iolo the Bard in Britain. He's a character that dates back to Ultima 1, and is based on Richard Garriott's real-life friend, David Watson, who would go on to be an XCOM Apocalypse level designer and lead mission analyst for Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. He has great dexterity and starts with a ranged weapon. Our second companion, the druid Janna, is in Yu. She's also based on a real-life friend of Richard's, also named Janna. Janna has good dexterity and ability with ranged weapons, and, you know, decent enough MP. Next, we pick up Jeffrey the Fighter from the Inn in Jellum. 
Like the others, he's based on a real person, Jeff Hillhouse, Origins Head of Operations. He is very strong, but since we're relying on ranged weapons, it doesn't matter, and he cannot cast spells. After that, it's off to Magencia for our Humility Companion, the Shepherd Katrina, who we missed entirely on our first visit here. She's based on Richard's friend, Kathy Flat. Her attributes are awful, and she has a terrible selection of weapons and armor, so what are you trying to say about Kathy here? Shimino the Ranger we pick up in Scarabray. Again, having been a ranger, Richard played in Dungeons and & Dragons and later his SCA persona. He's one of the few companions not originally from Earth, being a native to Britannia, and he's pretty well balanced. Next, we visit Minoc to get the Tinker Julia, based on a girl that Richard Garriott once dated. She has great dexterity and decent strength. And finally, there's Dupre the Paladin, based on Richard's friend Gerag Dykes' Intrinsic. He has good strength, but again, strength doesn't matter, but at least he can cast spells. If we weren't playing a mage ourselves, we could pick up Mariah in Moonglow, inspired by Michelle Cadal, Richard's personal secretary at origin. She's one of the only characters with enough MP to cast the Resurrection spell. We hand out the mystic armor to everyone in the party, equip them all with slings and bows, and there's a little trick we can use to max out everybody's stats. In each Ultima game, there's been a method to increase ability scores. In 2, it was giving gold to the clerk in Hotel California. In 3, it was donating to the shrines in Ambrosia. Now in 4, there are these orbs hidden in each dungeon, and the orbs will give you plus 5 to different attributes at a cost of 200 hit points per attribute. The most efficient ones are the ones in Dungeon Hithloth, which we can again reach through that back door in Lord British's castle. So we enter and cast the Exit spell, which brings us up to the dungeon's other end. From here, it's a quick trip, just two steps south and two steps east to an orb. We have our NPCs touch it, and it vanishes, but we can just leave and come back. Iolo gets a plus 5 to all three stats, but he also gets dead as dirt. It's not a big deal, we can cast Resurrect, but for now we'll just have all of our NPCs get the same boost before touching it ourselves. At level 8, we have 800 max hit points, which is enough to take the hit, long as we don't run into a huge group of monsters. After all, enemy group size is based on our party, not how many party members are alive. Once everyone but us is nice and dead, we can cast the Gate spell to go back to Castle Britain. Here, Lord British will heal us, but not bring anyone back from the dead. We need to cast Resurrect first, so the process of buffing everybody's stats is going to take a while, as we head to the dungeon, have everybody kill themselves with the orb, then resurrect them and gate back to the castle for free healing. We will do this until every stat is maxed out at 50. Now that the whole party is suitably beefy, we still have the issue that all of our companions have low hit points. And that means grinding. I want to get everyone to level 3 or 4 just to make sure that they can last. And with ranged weapons it's not too dangerous. It'll just take time. Not as much time as it we'd have lost if we recruited everyone at the start of the game. I really want to emphasize how much time not turning every fight into a pitched complicated tactical battle has been. Well, you can see that now, as all the fights to the end game are going to be pretty busy affairs. Not difficult, just complicated. And you can see how a full party makes combat so lengthy. We need to keep track of the tactics for eight characters in combat. Even if everyone's move is either going to be position yourself or fire, it's still going to take a while. We're going to take all the coins we earn while grinding and buy everyone the best ranged weapons we can afford. The Mystic Shorts are fine for up close, I guess, but I'm going to get magic wands for myself, Iolo and Janna, magic bows for most of the rest, a uh, crossbow for Jeffrey, and the sling is the best weapon poor Katrina gets, so it's what she's stuck with. Alright, we have our companions, we are an avatar, we have the bell, book, and candle, we have the optional skull of Mondain. The last thing we need to do to enter the abyss for the endgame is get the th key of three parts that the water elemental in Lord British's castle told us about. Each part is kept in an altar room, and each altar room is dedicated to four of the virtues. Truth is dedicated to honesty, honor, justice, and spirituality. 
Courage is valor, honor, sacrifice, and spirituality. Love is compassion, sacrifice, justice, and, yes, spirituality. You'll notice some overlap. Each virtue has a colored stone associated with it. This isn't the rune we needed to get into the shrine, but the stones hidden in the different dungeons. Honesty is blue, honor is purple, justice is green, spirituality is white, valor is red, sacrifice is orange, compassion is yellow, and justice is green. We already have the white stone, the one that wasn't in a dungeon. The altar rooms are also in dungeons, and they serve as bottom-level junctions connecting the four altars each. That's all pretty complicated, but the point is we need to dive into the dungeons, collect the stones, and bring them to the correct altars to get the pieces of key. It's here that the game really comes into its own. I love the puzzles or tactical scenarios that each dungeon room provides. It does get a little tricky as you have to navigate eight characters through a cramped space, and I find it helpful to have everyone but the leader leave after a fight so that any chests or triggers to open hidden doors are easy to hit. The subversion of using the until now simple combat system to create these complex rooms with tactical scenarios is a huge leap forward in CRPG level design. They're not quite puzzle rooms, and maneuvering a party of eight in turn one tile at a time is tiring, but it is really, for the mid 80s, very impressive. This is going to take a while now that the fights are so complex, so I'm not going to show you every single step. Just know that we're heading down to the dungeons, to the altar rooms, and getting the pieces of keys. Do you want to see a full 20-something part playthrough of the game? That's outside the scope of what we're doing here as an analytical playthrough, because as interesting as the dungeon rooms are, after you've seen them, you've seen them. There just isn't a lot to say about them individually without lose, losing the analytical focus and turning it into a tactical video. Still. Again, if you do want to see that kind of experiential, uh, on wonder, blow by blow, let's play video, let me know in the comments. I'll be honest, as much fun as that would be for me, it would take up more time than I have available to make it happen, unless the channel grows to the point where it pays me like a full time job. I cannot treat it like a full time job. I'm not saying it'll never happen, just that it's unlikely at the moment. All right, we managed to collect seven stones, use them on three altars to get the three parts of the key. Before we descend into the abyss, we have to get one final stone, the Black Stone of Humility. Morlin and Cove told us that the Black Stone is caught in a moon gate, but we can only reach it through a gate when both moons are dark. The gate that shows up when both moons are new is in Moonglow. All we have to do is enter the moon gate when it shows up. Notice that it doesn't send us anywhere, or rather, it sends us back to the exact same spot. But now we can search. Now that we have the Black Stone, we have everything we need for the end game. We have the Magic Ship Wheel, the Bell of Courage, the Book of Truth, the Candle of Love, we're an Avatar, we have all eight stones, we have eight companions, we have the three-part key, and we have learned the Word of Passage from the three rulers. The easiest way to the Abyss is to head due east from Trinsic. You'll bump into the island where you found the Shrine of Humility. There's a bay we need to enter from the side. It's here that we want to use the wheel we found in the ruins of the HMS Cape. We have to face off against an entire pirate armada, and even if we fight our way through, we're taking a lot of cannon fire. After that, it's a trek through a poison swamp, don't forget to heal like I did, to a lava field. We have no choice but to wade through molten rock to the center here, where, to enter the abyss, we need to use the bell, book, and candle in order. Now, I'm used to the phrase bell, book, and candle, so I naturally would use them in that order, but if you're not sure, you can find out by meditating extra at some of the shrines to find out which item goes in which order, and it, is, it does matter. Uh, this is also the point at which we can use mundane skull, destroying it into the abyss. Once that done, we can enter the endgame. The Abyss is funny. First of all, the individual rooms give us some great tactical challenges unseen anywhere else in the game, with a number of hidden passages and switchbacks. Two, it's also incredibly frustrating as it can trick you into repeating segments, and you'll need a lot of dispel spells. There are barriers that you must bypass, but it doesn't always work, 
so you may end up wasting three to five spells on a single barrier. If you run out, well, unless you're packing enough reagents to mix some more dispel spells, you're going to have to leave, buy more, then come back and start over. This is made doubly frustrating by the terrain of each room and the need to navigate eight party members around corners and past damaging terrain. It's slow going and the only healing you have are however many healing spells you've prepped. Many, however many that is, it still won't feel like it's enough. Even though the Abyss only has eight levels, that's eight levels of careful tactical combat without the ability to save once you're inside, without the ability to resupply. It borders on cruel, considering that the earlier game was a forgiving cakewalk in comparison. While ranged weapons are still the way to go, only magical weapons harm the monsters down here. That's magic bows and magic wands. However, our fighter and shepherd are unable to use those weapons, meaning that you're forced to have them rely on the swords, or more realistically, they'll never get to use them when you have two fewer attacks per round. It's such a blatant drop in fun from the rest of the game, it's like finding a worm in the middle of a delicious apple. Like finding half a worm, really. The end game is simply a chore. This is one case where I would definitely recommend watching a Let's Play instead of trying it yourself, and it's entirely due to the archaic 80s era user experience sensibilities. So leading up to the end, every level of the Abyss quizzes you on which virtues are made up of which principles and which color stone that's associated with. It's not difficult if you've been paying attention, but if you mistype or get it wrong, bzzzt, you're kicked out to the start. When you get to the very bottom of the eighth, you use the key and it asks you for the word of passage, Veramakor, and quizzes you again on the nature of each virtue and again boots you from the game for a wrong answer. We then get a gotcha question. What encompasses all of truth, love, and courage? This is tied to that missing quest line. The answer here is infinity, the word you get if you unscramble the letters from finishing each shrine. We're then told that the Codex reveals itself to thee, but not what that means exactly. And that we are truly a good person by the standards of Britannia's ethical framework. We also learn that Avatarhood is a living quest that never truly ends. A path that, rather than a destination, and that we are to return to Earth and serve as a living example of our path, securing the knowledge that, knowing the secrets of the gates, we can always return. So, Ultima Four. The story of Ultima IV is still, I wouldn't call it emergent, not in the way we talk about emergent roleplaying today, but aside from the opening and ending cutscene, it's still a collective of component parts that the player interacts with as they choose. You talk to NPCs, you perform actions, you hit milestones of personal development. There's a plot, sure, but it's the story of you and how you became the Avatar, and from the player's perspective, that's still told through your actions. I wouldn't call it linear, because the thread isn't strong enough. You can still do whatever you want, only there's really only one thing to do, but no direct story pressure to do it. If anything, your quest seems almost incidental, but in a way that's common to all of the computer RPGs of the era. I would say that where it's elevated is in the quantity and quality of those floating story elements that the player engages with. The keyword dialogue system, that the fact that the virtues are more than just a backdrop, Later games will take the ideas Richard Garriott presented here and run further with them and refine them, but once again, we have an Ultima game that presents a lot of them first. Would I recommend someone start the series with Ultima 4? It's a common response to the question, but no. No, it is definitely the first Ultima game I'd consider a full and complete RPG, but unless you're familiar with the way these old games work and what you're getting into, I'd actually recommend starting with 5 or even 6. Seven if you have very little stomach for the old school, and you can absolutely have a very complete experience of the franchise by only ever playing 7 and 7 Part 2. Ultima 4 simply has too many aggravating play sequences for casual modern gamers. The unfinished quest line giving the vital endgame password, the whole thing with the balloons, the entire abyss, they hide there like worms in an otherwise beautiful apple. 
any one of them, depending on how it hits your mood, is sufficient to destroy the entire experience unless you're very dedicated to trying to like the game. Thank you, viewers, for watching my analysis of Ultima 4. Despite my criticisms, it is absolutely one of the great milestones in computer RPG development. Keyword-based dialogue system, the morality tracking, the plot based on personal development, the tactical dungeon rooms, reagent mixing. It's a huge leap forward in so many ways, you just can't underestimate it. Next up, we're going to take a look at some of the console games inspired by the Ultima series. First with Dragon Quest, and then Final Fantasy. Make sure to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out, and if you want to support me, become a channel member, donate to my Ko-fi, become a Patreon member, whatever you want to do, everything helps. Until next time.